Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I am Jennifer Mitchell, and I am responsible for the district's educational resources. And today we have Suzanne Archer, who is our lead for agricultural assistance with the district. And she has been in agriculture for her whole career and at the district for seven years. So a little bit of housekeeping for the webinar today. Uh, everyone will be on mute throughout the presentations. I do hope that you have questions and you are welcome to type those in the question box on your uh, the right hand of your screen. We will get to those at the end of the presentation. We'll have a time for question and answers, and we will get to as many of those questions that we can during the 30 minutes. So at 11 o'clock, we'll stop, but we will, will reach out to any of you that have questions that we do not get to during the presentation. Please um, join us for our future webinars. The next one will be about water-wise landscaping on September 24th. And if you have any uh, additional comments or questions, please feel free to email me, Jennifer Mitchell. I appreciate that. So Suzanne, I am going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Jennifer. Good morning to everyone joining us today. And I'm gonna to talk to you about how growers are using technology and innovation to help protect the environment while producing food and other crops. First, I'd like to provide everyone with a better understanding of agriculture within the district by talking about agricultural water use and giving a brief overview of the types of crops grown to give you a sense of what ag looks like in our district. I will show you some of the types of projects that growers are using, and you will see how much technology is involved, involved both from an irrigation and a fertilizer perspective. If it's been a while since you've been on a farm, you might be surprised to hear how innovation is really driving efficiency from both an irrigation and fertilizer perspective. Lastly, I will talk about our agricultural cost share program and how growers are using it to implement projects that rely heavily on these technologies to reduce their impacts on the natural resources. The district measures and reports data for six water use categories, as you can see in the pie chart. The largest use category in our district is public supply, which isn't really surprising since we encompass both Orlando and Jacksonville and represents 55% of the total water use, followed by agricultural water use at 20% for 2019. As you can imagine, these percentages are going to vary somewhat for agriculture, depending on how much rainfall is received and when it's received. A lot of our production happens in the spring, which happens to be our driest months. Our district is very diverse in terms of agriculture. Putnam, Flagler, and St. John's counties comprise what is known as the Tri-County Agricultural Area. This area is roughly 30,000 acres of primarily row crops, including potatoes, cabbage, Asian vegetables, and sod. South Putnam and Northern Volusia are known for cut foliage, such as fern, and Orange and Lake counties have a high concentration of greenhouses and container nurseries, and these represented our highest water use for 2019. Brevard and Osceola have a high concentration of cattle production, which shows up on the chart as the hay slash pasture category, and this was actually our highest water use in 2018. Citrus includes both juice production, primarily in Lake County, and fresh fruit production in Indian River County. Citrus has often been at the top of the list in terms of water use, but citrus greening, a bacteria that is spread by an insect called a psyllid, damages and often kills the trees and has resulted in reduced acreages in recent years. There are certainly many more crops grown within St. John's, including everything from blueberries, tilapia, olives, and watercress, to rice, artichokes, which was on my cover slide in case you didn't know what that was, and medical marijuana, but I wanted to give you an idea of the primary commodity types grown within our district boundaries. The St. John's River Water Management District works to ensure adequate and sustainable water supplies are available to meet future needs while protecting the environment. In some areas, we are reaching the sustainable limits of withdrawal from the forward and aquifer. 
The ag community is absolutely dependent on an abundant, high quality water supply for the health of their crops and their livelihoods. More and more, they are moving to precision irrigation as part of their management systems. Besides protecting the water resources for their children and grandchildren, growers have some pretty compelling reasons to conserve water. First, precisely irrigating their crops reduces pumping costs, whether they're using diesel or electric pumps. Second, over irrigating is going to push the nutrients down through the soil profile and out of the root zone where it can't be used by the plant. Finally, over irrigating can lead to increased chances of plant disease because a moist environment is more conducive to pathogen growth. So let's take a look at what precision irrigation looks like for our district's growers. I'm gonna start with soil moisture sensors. Just like the name sounds, there are probes inserted in the ground, usually at varying depths, and measure the moisture available to the plant. The picture on the left shows a soil moisture sensor in a peanut field in the Citra area. There are probes placed at 6, 12, and 18 inches, plus a temperature gauge. You can see an antenna on the top of the probe. It has line of sight to the center pivot, and through telemetry with the grower's phone can turn the pivot on or off. The middle picture shows a soil moisture sensor in the container on a blueberry operation. Because blueberries need a low soil pH, they are often grown in bark mixtures and in this case containers, which makes it imperative for the grower to have an accurate picture of what's happening in the root zone. The picture on the right shows a soil moisture sensor in a field that is already that is ready to be planted. It has a solar battery pack to send data to the cloud. The flag is to show the tractor driver where the probe is throughout the growing season when the probe and battery are covered over with the crop. As you can imagine, more than one probe has met its demise once the crop covers it up. Studies in the Suwannee River Water Management District have shown 40% water savings or more with soil moisture sensors as long as they are used. Soil moisture sensor technology has come a long way in the past decade. The sensors have improved, but most importantly, the support for the grower has improved. I was in the field with a potato farmer a few years back and I asked him how he liked his soil moisture sensors and how they were working for him. I knew he was an innovator and bought some probes before the cost share program even funded them. He looked at me and told me he could never figure out what all those lines were supposed to mean and what he was supposed to do with them. Not gonna lie, they remind me of those hurricane spaghetti models. Sure, I got information, but what in the world am I supposed to do with it? Luckily, the support and software ease of use are increasing rapidly in the last few years. In the top graph, you can see the moisture at different soil depths. In the bottom, the graph is color-coded. Blue is saturation, green is the zone where you want to keep your soil moisture, and red shows onset of plant stress. This is where the vendor support really comes into play. The root zone is going to be different for various crops and will get deeper as the crop grows for something like corn or stay relatively stable for a crop like citrus, except of course for the first years of planting. These tools can really help the grower determine when to turn on the irrigation after rainfall event or whether he can wait another day in anticipation of rain. And during fruit set, the water intake increases dramatically and the grower can be sure that irrigation keeps up with the plant needs. Some of these soil moisture sensors now read electroconductivity, a measure of the salts or nutrients in the soil. When the grower can actually see the effect that rain or irrigation has on pushing the nutrients through the soil profile and down past the root zone, he can make better decisions for the management of his irrigation. Along with soil moisture sensors, weather stations play a key role in providing information to the growers about whether and when it's time to irrigate. Telemetry is a key part of the technology. When each piece is able to communicate with the other, we always say communication is everything, right? More and more when I visit growers on these projects, the first thing they do is pull out their phones and show me their irrigation apps. And Luckily, this it doesn't matter the age of the grower. I've had some very young growers and, and growers in their 70s all pulling out their smartphones. So that's very encouraging. 
For the middle picture, this was for a container nursery. Not only did the grower have access to moisture information, his meters were in measuring electroconductivity, or EC, shown as Dusty Siemens on his screen. This way, he knows where his nutrients are. Are they still in the root zone where he needs them, or are they in danger of being leached out? The picture on the right makes pump automation possible, which is the next practice I'd like to share with you. His phone shows him that he has programmed the stop condition at 45% moisture. Soil moisture sensors, weather stations, and telemetry through smartphones make pump automation possible. So pump automation, especially in citrus, is a very popular way to conserve water. So often growers will manage several grow flocks in various locations, sometimes miles apart, and one person is often in charge of manually turning on the pumps when it's time to irrigate, and then going back from site to site and turning off the pumps. Problems occur if the grower gets caught up in one of a hundred different things that can go wrong between turning on the pumps and getting back to turn them off. With pump automation, weather stations and soil moisture sensors are set up in the grow box to measure soil moisture, temperature, and wind, as you see on the slide. And in case you're wondering what the little ghosts are about, some of the growers use bags to keep the psyllids, the insects that transmit the greening disease, off their plants instead of using insecticides. So based on preset conditions, like we saw in the grower's phone on the last slide, the station communicates with the controllers on the pump for various zones. Each of those wires that you see is connected to a solenoid for each separate citrus block. From there, there's an automatic start-stop controller that slowly ramps the engine up and down as it starts and stops based on the presets. So let's switch gears a little bit. These pictures are of a greenhouse growing containerized ornamentals. The vast majority of greenhouses use containers with drainage holes in the bottom and place the containers on expanded metal benches. They irrigate until water just starts to run out the bottom of the container. What this means is that water and nutrients are hitting the ground or concrete, or concrete and either leaching or running off, usually into a pond. The grower wanted to do a better job for the environment. Some new greenhouses are being constructed with flood benches to completely capture this, but the grower didn't want to tear down the structures and start over. So what he did was lay troughs on top of the expanded metal benches, those little white things that you see on the picture on the lower right. Instead of having the water and fertilizer drip onto the ground, both between the pots and running out the bottom, the pots take up the water through capillary action. Any remaining water is sent outside to be filtered and collected back into the, plant, the, into the tanks to be used again. The EC or nutrients is measured and computers control the mixture of water and fertilizer. This system is now closed loop and saves both water and fertilizer. These pictures are from Trader Hills in Nassau County and they were already efficient with their water and nutrient management and have taken steps to become even more efficient. They are an aquaponics production facility raising both tilapia in the blue tanks on the left and leafy greens in a greenhouse in a closed loop system. Aquaponics is a system where the fish waste is used as a natural fertilizer for the plants. They took it a step further by purchasing and installing a rainwater collection system to help collect water from the greenhouse roof and to replace water lost to evaporation in the system. If you've ever been to Epcot's The Land, you can see a similar system, but these folks are doing it on a commercial scale for high-end restaurants in the Jacksonville area. The Tri-County Agricultural Area, which I mentioned earlier, consists of approximately 30,000 acres of row crops and sod in Putnam, Flagler, and St. John's counties. This area has historically been irrigated by seepage, which you can see a new field just prepped and then uh, an established one on the right. Water is sent down irrigation furrows, typically spaced every 60 feet throughout the field as shown in the pictures. The water table is raised through capillary action throughout the field. As you can imagine, this method is not particularly efficient since so much water can, is out there in the ditches to evaporate. 
during crop establishment, pumps might be turned on and left on 24 seven for the first six weeks of crop establishment, and then is needed after that until the crop is harvested. Growers have now converted almost a quarter of the acres in the area to more efficient systems within the past six years. One of these systems is sub-irrigation drain tile. Perforated pipe is placed underground in trenches as you see in the picture on the left and then covered up again. This is not like the open tile drain systems common in the Midwest, if you're familiar with those. Instead of just draining the fields and sending water and nutrients off site, the pipe is connected to control structures as seen in the top view in the image in the center of the slide and the graphic on the right. Boards are placed in the structures to back up water in the field when pumps are running and water is flowing through the pipes. Even when water isn't running, the boards keep the water table high in the field where roots can access the water. So as you can see, it's similar to the seepage in that water is delivered from the ground and on up to the roots, but in this case, it's not subject to evaporation. In times of heavy rainfall, the boards can also be removed and the water drains into perimeter ditches that also have control structures. These systems have been shown based on water use data submitted to the district to reduce water use by approximately half compared to the seepage systems. Even better, they serve to reduce nitrogen and, and phosphorus runoff based on University of Florida studies. Center pivots are the other system that has been replacing seepage irrigation, both in the Tri-County Ag area as well as in other areas of the district. While this isn't really new at all, they have become more efficient over the years with drop hoses like you see on the left that put the nozzles closer to the ground and low pressure heads that deliver larger droplets that are less likely, likely to evaporate or to be affected by wind before they hit the ground. But with variable rate irrigation, each of those individual drop hoses can now deliver different amounts of water based on GIS information. This can account for things like different soil types in the field, turning off irrigation over wetlands, or to account for overlapping pivots. So we've talked a little bit about irrigation, so let's switch gears now to the fertilizer side of the equation. The days of simply broadcasting fertilizer at the same rate over an entire field or grove are coming to a close. Growers are embracing the four R's, right time, right place, right source, and right rate. Precision fertilizer application addresses right place and right rate in particular. The picture on the left is a fertilizer bander and shows right place. Prior to these banders, the fertilizer was broadcast and the nutrient would end up in the alleys or the space between the rows, which is A, not where the plant is growing, and B, is subject to runoff and rainfall events. Fertilizer is expensive and growers don't wish to see their investment washed away. You can see in the picture that the pipes drop fertilizer directly on the beds where the plants will be emerging. The picture on the right shows liquid fertilizer tanks as part of a fertigation system. This is a method of spoon feeding a crop through frequent small liquid fertilizer applications instead of one or two dry fertilizer applications that could be subject to washing away during a heavy rain. In this case, the liquid fertilizer was delivered through a microspray system in very small but frequent doses, just enough for what the citrus trees could take up, but not more. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier, I'm sorry, what we have here is a dying tree in between two relatively healthy trees. I mentioned citrus greening has hit the citrus industry hard. It leaves groves with dead or dying trees scattered throughout. Many times the dead trees are removed and replanted with a young tree. So you get a grove with a mix of mature trees, dead or dying trees, and young trees. Typical fertilizer spreaders, whether for dry fertilizer or liquid foliar applications, apply the same amount of product to every tree. So the tree in the middle would get exactly the same amount of fertilizer as the trees to the left and right. And a reset or new tree would get the same amount as the mature trees. To solve this problem, tree sensing technology, I'm doing air quotes here, reads, the amount of canopy on every tree as it passes. 
The sensor is typically mounted on the tractor, as you see in that little circle on the right hand side, um, right there on the tractor, or at the front, of the front of the spreader and sends a signal to the spray nozzles or spreader. The machine would then turn off for dead trees, apply a small amount for replanted trees, and apply the full amount for, mat for mature trees in good health, kind of like Goldilocks, just right. For foliar application of liquid fertilizer, the machine on the left could spray just the low nozzles, the mid, uh, the low and mid range, or all three sections, depending on the amount of canopy it sensed. These types of equipment are saving the growers considerable amounts of fertilizer and thus money while reducing the amount of nutrients hitting the ground. Growers are reporting that they can dramatically reduce the amount of fertilizer they use depending on the individual grow, the amount of replanted trees or damaged trees. Tree sensing technology is being taken to the next level with LIDAR, which stands for light detection and ranging. This goes beyond just sensing that there is or isn't a tree there. It can analyze the shape of the tree and just apply foliar fertilizer where the tree is and not where it isn't. This avoids applying fertilizers in areas that might hit the ground. The bottom picture shows, or the bottom row shows the blue areas that will get fertilizer and the surrounding areas that won't. This video shows a conventional sprayer that only has an on or off position as shown on the left. The sprayer on the right is operated with the LiDAR technology and you can see that it pulses high, low, on and off as it goes down the row. This is particularly useful in tree nurseries where some trees are round shaped, some are cylindrical, and some may be pyramid shaped, not to mention taller and shorter. We have heard estimates of reductions in fertilizer around 40% with these systems. Another technology that's being used more and more to achieve the right rate is soil grid mapping. Historically, when soil tests are sent in for analysis, the grower takes several samples throughout the field, mixes them together, and sends them off for analysis and fertilizes based on the composite sample. With soil grid mapping, the grower takes samples and marks each one with a GPS point. The samples are sent to a lab for analysis and a flash drive with recommendations for each nutrient at any given point in the field. The flash drive is plugged into a controller on the tractor, which communicates with the fertilizer application equipment. The unit can turn on and off, deliver more or less material depending on where it is in the field and what level of nutrient is needed. Here's a wide drop machine, which absolutely nails the right place of the four R's. It is compatible with GPS and soil grid mapping, so in addition to accurate placement, each individual drop is independent and can turn on and off as necessary to apply fertilizer or chemical only where it's needed. The picture on the upper left shows the flexible tubes running right next to the corn plants. I'd like to wrap up by taking a moment to talk about the district's Ag Cost Share Program. For every dollar that you spend at the grocery store, less than 15 cents goes to the farmer, according to the United States Department of Agriculture. Growers operate on tight margins, and some of these practices can be cost prohibitive to implement without cost share assistance. The district-wide agricultural cost share program was started in 2015, and along with contributions to the Tri-County Agricultural Area Partnership, over 20 million in funding has been provided to implement 159 projects. Over 12 million gallons per day of water has been estimated to have been conserved or made available through alternative water supplied. Total nitrogen annual loading has been reduced by almost 456,000 pounds, and total phosphorus has been reduced by over 85,000 pounds annually. When we receive applications, we rank the projects and have staff calculate the estimated conservation and nutrient loading reduction in order to select the most impactful projects. But we don't stop there. In order to help assure that we're being fiscally responsible, we conduct irrigation audits before and after project implementation and perform site visits to assess how the growers are implementing their projects. Here are just a few excerpts from emails we've received where the growers share with us their actual results. So whether it's reducing fertilizer use in one spring by 23 tons or reducing water use by a third while increasing production area, growers have been pretty excited about project results and we have as well. 
Uh, with that, I'll wrap up and thank you. And I hope that you have enjoyed the presentation. Thank you so much, Suzanne, for that great presentation. It shows that there is a whole lot new uh, technology than, than those that may not be uh, in agriculture that we, we may not realize. Um, there are a few questions coming in, so I will remind everyone that you are welcome to ask um, questions about uh, the presentation. The first question is about how expensive is a LIDAR machine? So would that be something an individual farmer would purchase? So the LIDAR machines, you can actually retrofit your existing equipment. So as you saw in the video, the one on the left and the right were exactly the same piece of equipment. So the district isn't buying the equipment. We're just using the LIDAR. They come with annual subscriptions because they're constantly being updated. but uh, for the system that we did, it, it ranged around $10,000 per machine. Wonderful. There was a question about, um, about how many farms are there in the district, and that might not be a number that you have off, of the, off the top of your head, but it might be. And then um, there's also a question about um, are there specific kinds, and this may not be a, a topic that would be incorporated in this, but that use biosolids. So in terms of, of what type of fertilizer they're using. Sure, as far as the number of farms, um, I do not have that, but I can, you know, we can look and see how many consumptive use permits that we have, although some operators and growers will have more than one consumptive use permit, uh, but I will look and see what I can do with that. And then keep in mind that a lot of the uh, farms will lease out their land to other growers. So, you know, like I said, it's a little bit of a moving target, but I'll do my best to get an answer for that and get it to Jennifer. And then as far as the use of biosolids, um, this has certainly been something that the district has been involved in, but DEP is the actual permitting, permitting entity um, that would regulate that. We have a whole group that has been working on that, and I'm sure that they would uh, be able to give a, a little bit better answer. Uh, so we can, you know, if, if, if Jennifer, if you have um, the person's name that asked that, I, I think Absolutely. that I can get help from them and, and we could be able to get that answer. But then, of course, with Senate Bill 712, uh, there's further restrictions on it. So I think that that number may be changing as we move forward. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that with um, the uh, even the question of, of the number of farms that, that there is a fair amount of uh, an individual may own a large area, but it might be, like you said, leased out to multiple people. Uh, I do want to remind everyone there was an, a great comment about what a wonderful overview this was. Please do remember that since it is recorded, you will be able to share it with anyone that you might um, want to do. Uh, and you want to make sure have seen it. Are there, well, uh, beyond just a couple more minutes, if there are any other questions to come in. I really appreciate the, the very thorough overview that you did, um, Suzanne. So thank you. And lots of uh, appreciation for your presentation. Well, thank you very much for having me and, and thanks to everybody that listened in. All right, uh, doesn't seem like there are any other questions coming in. So thank you all for your attention today. Please attend our next webinar, uh, the WaterWise Landscaping, and we will get back to those of you who have questions that um, we, we were not able to give a specific answer to with the appropriate person uh, in contact. So thank you all for your attention today and have a great rest of your day.